So we have a really, really long program today, um, but feel free to ask any relevant questions. Um, don't put your hand up and say, I've got possum in my attic, what do I do? Um, if it's about a rat or a gopher, we'll cover it today. And if you have questions like that and we have time after, I'll be able to um, ask you them. So what's a vertebrate? Um, basically, any chordate animal of the subphylum vertebrata, characterized by a bony or cartilaginous skeleton and a well-developed brain. Now most of us have, definitely have the spine, some of us definitely don't have the brains. <laughs> but that's like the fish, the amphibians, so um, like the, um, you know, the things, that, things that live in water and things that live on land, they're all vertebrates, okay? Uh, things with fur, things with feathers, things with scales. Um, what's a pest? A person or thing that annoys, especially by imposing itself when it's not wanted, a nuisance. So that's what my, that's what my mother calls me, a pest. Or an organism that damages crops, injures or irritates livestock or man, or reduces the fertility of land. So that's kind of the pest that we'd be more interested in. Um, and this is becoming more and more of a pest as well, or defined uh, in the definition of a pest, is an epidemic disease or pestilence. So um, a lot of diseases are being considered pests as well, and a lot of rare animals um, carry pests too. So what kind of pests do we have? We have the rodents. Okay, so things like the squirrels, the rats, the mice, the gophers, the voles. And um, feral animals are considered pests. These guys, wild pigs, huge pests in California, causing millions of dollars worth of damage. Believe it or not, these things are also considered pests, okay? Feral cats carry disease and they are extremely harmful to the environment. So sorry for any cat lovers out there. I'm not going to cat bash today, but. We're in the process of writing a feral cat pest note. They are considered pests. And um, the carnivores um, can be considered pests as well. If you lived in Orange County or LA County, you would have lived in a county that had over 20 bites uh, from coyotes to humans last year. In San Diego, I believe you guys had two bites. Okay, so we had two and six and I think 14 in LA. So there's a lot of coyote bites. Mountain lions, not really what you would think of as a pest. But the actual um, second biggest cause of death to mountain lions in this area are depredation permits. And depredation permits are issued to people who've had their livestock killed by mountain lions. Okay, what's the first number one cause of death to mountain lions? Cars. Okay, we, are, we kill them. One and two. Okay. So that's kind of unfortunate, but that's, they're considered pests to some people. Okay, so what kind of other pests do we have? Rabbits. Rabbits. Raccoons. Raccoons. Awesome. Wow. Squirrels, squirrels or rodents? Squirrels. Skunks. Raccoons. 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 Think of a small pest that's not a rodent, but everybody thinks is a rodent. Awesome. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. no, mine's the rodent. Mole. Someone said mole. Okay. So, possums, raccoons, moles, skunks, snakes, rabbits, birds. Okay. All considered pests, depending on what they do. All right. So why do we control vertebrate pests? Right, well, rodents and other vertebrate pests, they cause all sorts of damage to uh, landscapes, crops, your food, your clothing, they chew up documents, things like electrical wires. Um, anybody have a new Honda? <laughs> 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 so your new Hondas, the wires are coated, coated in soy. <laughs> okay? So just watch out for the rats because the rats are chewing the wires in the new Hondas. Okay? And there's, there's lawsuits and everything going on about this, but um, yeah, it's happening. Um, hopefully you can see that picture, but that's a sizzle. That's like a Kentucky Fried Rat, basically. Okay? And that doesn't seem like a big number, 128,000 fires caused by rodents a year. But I mean, it's 128,000 less fires we could potentially have if we kept rodents out of our homes and kept our wires properly protected. And this is an example of damage to landscape. So we have a gopher and a mole. And I'll tell you guys the difference between the two of them, but you can see that they, they cause significant damage to turf. And this is a picture of them in our food. Yum. Yeah. Yeah, I know, it's very pleasant. Um, this is um, everybody's favorite type of tortilla. Nice burrito, nice burrito. You probably got that one from Chipotle too. Here's a nice, here's a nice dead mouse eating someone's coffee. Yeah. 
and they, like it's not just rodents. So like other pests get into our trash and knock things over and just get things out. And we have to come up with all these different tools, and it's expensive, and you know it, they they cause a lot of damage, and they also cause disease. Okay, so has anybody ever heard of rat bite fever? Okay, you know you can get things like rat bite fever. You could actually get asthma if there are mice and rats running around in the roof. The allergens from the, their dander on their skin um, have actually been linked to childhood asthma. Um, so things that you wouldn't even you wouldn't even think about that, they, that you could get diseases from. A lot of the time, they're, um, the diseases from rodents come from aerosolized urine and feces. Okay, so it's not actually from the rodent itself. Their rat by fever definitely comes from the rodent. Okay, things like plague that comes from the flea on the rodent. Um, this is um, actually an old paper. Hopefully you can see it. Um, but this it, this cracks me up. This like venomous snakes, six thousand to seven thousand non-fatal injuries a year. But look, rodents is really high up on the list, four thousand three hundred two. Um, a year, but hardly any fatal diseases. But if you get a rat or rodent disease, you're really going to know about it. They're they're extremely unpleasant. I know because I've had one. Um, I've had European hantavirus, and it's really not pleasant. Um, you feel like you're going to die for about three days, and then you're popping fresh after your grand. But this one, this one cracks me up because this one's um, American alligators. Ten point five people have had non-fatal injuries from. Um, uh, alligators. So I mean, there's a range of different vertebrate pests that cause different problems, and um, skunks, everything. I mean, it runs the the, the the you know the gauntlet from you know skunks to rodents to you know you can get salmonella from possums. Um, so the, the moral of the story is just don't pick up any feces, but also you need to be aware that it doesn't always come from the act directly from the animal. Aerosolized urine feces, like I said, the dander you can get it from anywhere. This is a, a, a picture of a toddler's arm that's been bitten by a rat. Okay, pretty nasty, um, but it does happen. A lot of the time, rat bite fever actually comes from domestic rats, so from pet rodents. Okay, it doesn't always come from um, your rats. But like, I mean, you this this probably had a very attentive parent, but because the rat just very lightly just gnawed on the arm, you know, the toddler probably didn't really notice that much. Cats. Sorry, I know I said wouldn't cat bash, bash too much, but cats um, carry quite a lot of disease as well. Um, and it's not only diseases that affect us, it's diseases that affect other wildlife. So what's happening is, is that generally, when I say feral cats, I talk about, I mean feral cat colonies, so, you know, huge groups of cats that are maintained by a feeder. And what happens is, is that their feces accumulate and then they're washed out. It's just like a bad application of a pesticide. It gets into the water eventually. Um, and what it's actually doing is it's killing endangered monk seals. It's killing otters. Okay, it's been linked to all these, um, you know, um, already sensitive native mammals. Um, so it's not just uh, us that get, you know, suffer from diseases from wildlife. It's it's other um, things that are actually supposed to be here in the first place. Um, anybody ever heard of typhus? Yeah. So typhus is a fairly old disease that everybody thinks is, you know, gone, wrong, really wrong. And for some reason, Orange County, LA, I think they have it in Riverside and San Diego now, but not as much. And um, it's, it's back and it's coming in clusters and the clusters are usually right beside fer maintained feral cat colonies. Okay, and it comes from, from cat fleas. And um, so a, a range of animals can cause a range of diseases. And um, this is a park in Orange County in Lake Forest. I felt dirty after I came away from looking at this park. It's just covered, covered in feces, okay? And not only is that dangerous for adults, extremely dangerous for children and people that are immunocompromised, but most of these birds are eventually gonna die of botulism because you can't, you can't clean that much feces. It just gets into the water, it just becomes so dirty. So, and the reason why these are here in such great numbers is because we are feeding them, okay? And I'm gonna get into that later as well. Okay. <laughs> I love working with Master Gardeners. You're more than welcome to call me and email me. It's probably better to email me because if you call me, I probably won't be there to answer my phone. Um, but I will answer any of your questions, but there's certain things that I absolutely never ever want to hear, okay? It is illegal to feed wildlife. Don't feed cats. Don't feed birds. Okay? You can feed the birds in your backyard if you want. But definitely don't feed ducks, don't feed swans, don't feed the geese. 
right? Bird feeders. He was a bird feeder in their backyard. Okay? You are contributing to the death of songbirds. Who here cleans their bird feeder? Okay, so you guys are a little bit more responsible. Okay? Yeah, because they have, they're just covered in diseases. Birds are covered in disease. They come in, you know, they feed, they fly off. Another bird comes in, contracts that disease. Maybe they're a naive population and they just drop. And this guy's the... Um, Oh, it's like a siskin or something, I can't think what it's called, um, the pine siskin. Um, and they're dropping all over the place in um, North America and they couldn't figure out what it was. And it's, a, it's coming from bird feeders. Okay, technically it's illegal to feed birds. Okay, but someone from Fish and Wildlife is not going to come to your, your backyard and give you a ticket. But just know that it is illegal to feed wildlife. So I don't like, I don't like any stories about that. Okay, it is illegal to translocate wildlife. <coughs> So if you get a squirrel or a possum or a skunk and you catch it in a live trap and you bring it somewhere else, don't tell me, I'll probably call your local warden and I'll snitch on you, okay? It's one of the worst practices as wildlife caretakers that we could ever do in our whole entire lives. What happens is you get something like a skunk, okay? You bring it to another habitat, doesn't know where it is, doesn't know where to find food. Either it has disease and it gives it to another population, or it's naive to that disease and it comes, you know, you, they get disease from that population that's already there and they'll just die really quickly. A terrible, horrible death. Okay, distemper, rabies, you name it. Things that are territorial, yes? What, uh, number one, why would we even use live traps in another street? The catch from a live trap, what's the best? So, that's a really good question. If you don't know what you're going to do with your animal when you set your live trap. Well, then you have no business setting your live trap, okay? Once you set it, once you catch an animal in a live trap, you have to euthanize it or release it right there and then, okay? They're your only two options. Euthanasia, usually something like carbon dioxide, which you can buy, you know, there's lots of, um, like a brewery or somewhere, one of those, you can buy a can of carbon dioxide. You can follow the American Veterinary Med Medical Association rules and um, that's what I would do and um, you can literally get yourself if you really really want to not have that wildlife in your backyard you can buy a cooler as, as big as your trap and you can just hook that CO2 up and um, now it's a little bit more complex than that but we will eventually and um, we'll have actually a website for ground squirrel control um, and on that it will tell you exactly how to calculate flow rate and all these kind of things so you do need to know about flow rate before you turn on your tank um, and you need to know approximately the, the, the size of your animal, but it's, it's, it's pretty simple, yes? Brownie? No. 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 Hold on a second. <laughs> so all of this is coming from the Fish and, fish and, fish and Wildlife Fish and Game Code, which is, it's all very com confusing. It's the fish, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, but this is their book, the Fish and Game Code. Okay, so it says immediate dispatch or release all fur-bearing non-game mammals that are legal to trap must be immediately killed or released. You can shoot them in the head. If it is legal to discharge a firearm in your municipality, a bullet to the head or right in the side of the chest, right into the heart. Okay, it's very, very humane. It's very, very quick. Okay, and it is illegal to drown wildlife. <laughs> Okay, this is, a, I think, a fairly new law. You, and I mean, that goes from everything to, um, from a mouse to all the way up, it is illegal to drown wildlife. So, like I said, if you're going to set a trap, you need to have what comes after that. Okay, so that's why when you read the pest notes, we don't generally, re you know, recommend live trapping. Okay, because most people don't actually want to kill wildlife, they just don't want it in their yard. Right. But you have to be responsible. If you want to get rid of that wildlife from your yard, you have to make sure that if you do it or someone you paid to do it is not bringing it somewhere else. Because you're going to just give the problem to someone else. Or you're just going to, you know, spread out that um, non-native mammal. Eastern fox squirrels, that's how they got all over the place. All these orange little squirrels that are running about the place, not supposed to be here pushing out your native western grey squirrel um, and nobody's doing anything about it, I'm not really sure why um, but they're because people didn't want them, they got them from their yards and they brought them somewhere else okay so now they're problems somewhere else and now they're causing problems to your native wildlife in a much bigger range than they should already have so like I said 
more than welcome to ask me any questions, but I don't want to hear any of this stuff. So I'm just kind of curious. The tree squirrel is is a game animal under cow fishing game, but the ground squirrel isn't. Why? Depends on your species of squirrel. Okay, so your eastern fox squirrel is considered non-game. And that's your, the ground squirrel? That's no, that's not the ground squirrel. That's the, tree. That's, that's the tree squirrel. So the eastern fox squirrel is a tree squirrel, uh -huh. and it's considered non-game. Oh, your okay. eastern gray and your western gray are considered game. Okay. Okay, it's re and it's re their management's really complicated. So grays, ha grays have um, a season, eastern fox squirrels don't, and so do California ground squirrels. Okay, and California ground squirrels are considered non-game because there's so many of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they're considered a nuisance. Whereas a, tr a western, uh, a western um, gray squirrel, which is your native to California, um, it's not considered a nuisance. It's native wildlife, and it's you know it's not seen to actually cause any damage. Um, but it does have hunting season. Okay, and the key component between the western and the eastern ground squirrels, if I see them in my tree, what's an easy way to tell them apart? <laughs> so I'm not shooting so the wrong one. If you see an eastern ground squirrel in your tree, you've got some sort of a ninja squirrel. Yeah. Okay, ground squirrels don't climb trees. <laughs> <laughs> I got some ninja squirrels, baby. <laughs> They're running from the ninja papillons. So the, the ground squirrel will always run Sorry. down and the tree squirrel will always run up. Okay. <laughs> So if I see a tree squirrel, it's probably my native squirrel. Yeah. Depends. It oh, depends on what Jesus. color it is. If it's gray, okay, it's probably a western gray squirrel. If it's kind of an orangey brown color, it's probably an eastern fox squirrel, which is a tree squirrel okay. as well. Eastern fox. But there's there's um the UC IPM people they put out a uh, thing called the Green Bulletin. And there's they have a green bulletin and they have something called the retail newsletters. And they're 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 not Generally, I don't think for master gardeners, but I think master gardeners subscribe to them a lot. Mm. And there's two articles on tree squirrels in there. Okay, one's called tree squirrel identification and management, and one called one's called something else about tree squirrels. Um, and they'll help you. And that Vietnamese lady, Niam He Queen, she wrote those. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but they they'll definitely help you with the they'll help you with the with the dis to distinguish between all the species. Now it talks more about um, tr tree squirrel management, but you also have your pest note for ground squirrel management. Okay. okay. All right, cruelty to animals. Um, I also do not want to know that if you have trapped an animal, that you have either cruelly beaten it, mutilated, or anything else. You cannot compress its chest. You cannot stand on animals. People think you can, but you can't. Right? It's cervical dislocation. I'm pretty sure I'm probably the only one that knows how to do that in here. Um, it's death by CO2, or it's do not trap it at all. Okay? It's like focus on things like habitat modification and exclusion, okay? All right, so. That's I'm making them serious. Right, though. so that's all, that's the serious stuff, by the way. But you can seriously ask me any questions other than those. Um, so vertebrate pests, what's important? Well, you need to ID them. If you don't know what you have, you have no business measuring it. You, can't, you shouldn't be putting out a trap. You definitely shouldn't be putting out a toxicant, okay? Or even, even a live trap, because you don't know what you're gonna catch. Okay, you don't want to catch a native mammal that's kind of supposed to be there in the, in the same place, unless it's causing you some sort of problem. Um, obviously, damage is important. Um, you know, you can identify um, vertebrate pests by, by the signs that they leave behind. The biology is really important because the biology helps us with this stuff. Okay, and um, you think, oh, why is it important that I know that this is awake or this eats that or whatever? Well, if this is awake at night, we know, well, let's just set our traps at night, okay? That way you won't catch any birds in your traps, or you'll just catch rodents. Or if this thing only eats, you know, 20 foot away from its nest, well, then what's really important is to actually find its nest and um, to focus the time and stuff like that so you can set your traps close to the nest. So we're going to talk about all these kind of things when it comes to rodents. Um, so knowing your pets, you can't manage what you can't measure. You need to know is that mound a mole or a gopher? Because this is a gopher trap and this is a mole trap. Okay? One will not catch the other. All right? You need to know what you have. And um, is it a house mouse or a deer mouse? How do you know the difference? Um, and it makes a difference because some, if you want to use a rodenticide, some labels will have house, well, all labels will have house mice if you're using a rodenticide. 
but not all will have a deer mouse, okay? Do you have a roof rat or a Norway rat? Um, anyone here catch rats? Anyone know what kind of rats they have? I have a picture. I think they have a picture. <laughs> I get loads of really nice pictures into my email. My favorite one is named that poo. Yeah. <laughs> I get them all the time. Hey, what's this? And it's just a picture of some feces. Um, but it's important to know because they have different biology, okay? Roof rats spend a lot of time up, up, up high. Nori rats spend a lot of time down low. So that will help you know where you're going to put your traps. And um, so damage, does anyone know what made this? Hmm. No. So this was, in a, a, this was an orange tree in a whiskey barrel that was about this high off the ground, the whiskey barrel. So the damage is probably about this high off the ground. Uh, no, 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 no. Rabbit? Yes, who said that? Yeah, rabbit. Okay, and it took me a while. I mean, I was like, oh, you know, deer is a bit different than that. And I was like, that's so high off the ground for rabbit, but it's classic rabbit damage. Um, deer looks like this. But when deer take the branch off, they actually rip the branch. So there's kind of a little flick of bark left beside it. So these things are all really important because, you know, there's a big difference between managing rabbits and managing deer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, this is a big problem in Southern California. And probably why I get lots of calls is I have, oh, poor me, my macadamia nut tree is getting eaten by rats. And oh, my lovely avocados in my backyard. I have a 900 square foot apartment, so I get really jealous by everybody telling me <laughs> <laughs> about their lovely yards. But this is a huge problem. This is probably one of the main reasons. Um, I know in Orange County why people actually want to control pests is because they're getting damage to food and fruit. And then tomatoes is a big one as well because rats love tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Love tomatoes. And mm -hmm. um, so these are your these are your go your gopher and your mole mouths. Okay, whoops, there. Okay, so it's important to know which one you have because if you don't know, like I said, you can't really tell what you're going to measure uh, or what you're going to manage. Okay, so does anybody wait, wait, know? Which one was which? I'll tell you later. Oh, okay. I don't want to ruin this. No, don't worry. I don't want to ruin the surprise. <laughs> so does anybody know? These are two different vertebrate pests. Can anybody tell what the one on the left is? Pigs. Pigs, yes. Okay, so that's what you get to look forward to when a feral pig comes into your yard. Anybody know what this is? Skunks? Mm, close. Raccoons. Okay, so skunk looks similar to this as well. It's actually kind of hard to tell whether it's a skunk or a raccoon, but it, the damage would be similar because they just get their nose under the, the turf and they're looking for the invertebrates and they just scoop them all out. But this is significant economic damage okay grass is kind of expensive in southern california and so you don't want this to happen so why would the biology be important like i said things like if they're active at the day during the day or night that's key to their management because you don't want to waste your time i mean people in california are so busy i i just sleep less but i don't i don't know i'd rather i'd rather just trap when i have to trap okay the niche level, like I said, where is your animal active? Does your animal, is your animal only active up high or down low, or is it actually a mix? Okay, so that's important to know as well. And um, are they neophobic? That's really important. Neophobic is the f uh, fear of new things. Um, and that's what happens with rats. Rats are afraid of new things. So you might go out and start thinking you're a terrible rat trapper, but it's just that it takes a while for the rats to get used to it. So this is why all the, um, all these things are really important. The life cycle is really important. And um, the diet is really important. And um, what they like to eat, okay? We need to know all these things before we go in to manage them. So this is just an example of why the life cycle is important for management. And this is from our new California Ground Squirrel Management website. And um, it's not online yet. And um, we're actually getting it peer reviewed because we want to make sure that's, you know, perfect. Um, and so, what this is, is this is the activity, okay? So you see here, the adults are active kind of from late January all the way around to October. Now in Southern California, it's likely that ground squirrels are almost active all year round because you guys have such great weather. Um, so this is, um, when is when is baiting effective? When I say baiting, I mean the use of a toxic bait to control ground squirrels. I'm not talking about a fumigant, I'm talking about a toxic bait, so like something like a grain that you would put out and the, the squirrels would feed on and they would, they would um, die, right? So it's only effective from May to October, 
okay? It's not effective during January all the way to May when the adult is active. And the reason why is because the toxic bait that we use to manage ground squirrels, the carrier, so what we, what we put it on, is a grain. Ground squirrels don't start to eat grain to right here. Okay? So these are things that they, you know, as they studied more and more wildlife and, you know, got to know what's going on, these are things we can use to help manage these things. So management, it ranges literally all the way from the bottom to things like habitat modification and sanitation, which is really important for rats, and things like repellents, and then all the way up to the lethal, so trapping, whether it's live or kill trapping, toxic baits, and then fumigants, okay? So we have a whole range of things that you can use. Um, and you know, as part of your plan, you should probably be trying to start here at the bottom and moving your way up, okay? And as you move your way up, you can forget about some things. Um, but other, most of these are, are very, very important tools. And it's important to use everything that we have in our toolbox in moderation, okay? Where do you find all this? People spend hours, and by people, I mean people like me, <coughs> spend hours writing these pest notes, okay? They don't just write themselves. Usually someone writes them. If I don't write one, the person that writes it, I have to review it. It takes us hours to put these all together, okay? They're on absolutely everything you could really think of, and they have really great information. Now, I complain that the pest notes are backwards, so you have to actually know what you have, before you go into the pest note to find the information on how to manage it. And we are working on a tool, we're not working on a tool, we're working on money to try and build a tool <laughs> that will help you guys basically go, go from the front end in. So you just say, you, we'd have a t it would be a mobile app, you'd have a picture of a burrow in the ground, okay? or you have a burrow in, in the ground, you're like, oh, I don't know what that, we'll give you examples. We'll show you a squirrel burrow, we'll show you um, a vole burrow, we'll show you a rat burrow, and hopefully that will help you. You'll be able to pick your burrow and go back, go into the pest note that way. So that way you're not like going through like 50 million pest notes trying to figure out what's wrong, what do I have, how do I manage it. So we're just trying to make it a little bit more digestible. But there's loads of them, everything. I mean, skunks, rats, possums, deer, pocket gophers, big swallows. Um, and it's really important to know what you have. And this is a good start. This is a really, really good place to start. What's not there is feral cats. I literally just submitted um, the first draft of the paper to the editor, so it is coming. Um, if you like cats, don't read it. Um, <laughs> the wild turkey pest note is going to be written. Um, wild turkey is not really a problem down here, I don't think. Um, but there are huge issues in places like Sacramento. And it's funny, because I work with a wildlife veterinarian, and he told me that they're going, they're, they're going to recommend to the city that they do turkey vasectomies to get rid of the churches. So, so, so wait till the turkeys come to San Diego because that's probably what happened in Southern California too. And so it will be written, it hasn't been started, we're kind of, because there's only two of us to write pest notes, it takes two of us now, there used to be a way more vertebrate pest people, but there's only two of us now, so it takes a while to get all these going. We don't have that many bird pest notes, which is kind of a shame, because things like seagulls and Canada geese, they can be big pests, and especially not just to homeowners, but like, you know, park managers and, you know, people that work in golf courses and stuff like that, so it is. And um, I do believe that we have a new Lyme disease pest note. Now, I don't know if it's been published yet, but I think it's written and ready to be published. And um, so look out for that, because that's obviously a big issue. Um, but there's all sorts of diseases that you can get from vertebrate pests and we, and we try and put them in the pest notes because that's one of the reasons why you manage these things is because of their disease. It's not just the damage they cause, okay? It's, it's their diseases. Um, so vertebrate pests in San Diego County, obviously you have way more than this, okay? Way, 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 way more. Um, I mean, feral pigs are a huge issue in San Diego County, but these are the ones as master gardeners that you're probably going to have to answer the most questions about. So I, I, want, I don't want you to be like a jack of all trades and a master of none. I want you to have the right information um, and good information about these pests and then hopefully in the future we can do some more advanced training or whatever on, on all the other stuff. Um, so rats and mice. Okay, why do we control rodents? Damage, already talked about it, okay? Disease. 
Um, I don't know if you guys see that, but do I have arrows for this? No, I don't. I should, probably shouldn't put it. This is the top of this tapeworm right here. Oh. 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 This wow. is the bottom. Okay? These things can live inside people. Okay? Right? This is a flea. Okay? A lot of diseases that come from rats, rats and other rodents and other vermin pests come from this guy. Okay? Come from the flea. Um, I do a lot of coyote work and regu regularly get bitten by fleas and luckily I haven't gotten too sick yet. But um, it's, it, it can happen, you know, you need to be careful if you're working with wildlife or domestic animals and they have fleas. Particularly in Southern California with typhus on the rise, okay? People don't like rats. I love rats. I mean, I really, really do. I really think, I think they're kind of cute. I don't see what the problem is with their tail, but people just don't like them, okay? People, you know, some people think, oh, they're gross. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people don't like them as well. It's kind of like an image thing, you know, or people, people think they're dirty, which they are, and they don't want them in their home. Okay, so classic rodent signs. If you have an, a, um, a snail shell like this in your yard, it's probably a rat that's eaten that, okay? Probably. Um, these are those lovely macadamia nuts. Okay, um, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, and um, maybe it's easier to see on the on the TV, the TV screens. You can see there's like little striations along here. Okay, um, and it's funny the way they're shaped. So you can see that the it kind of the feeling almost goes like that, and that's because of the way they hold them. I'm like this. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, this this is the kind of thing that's just not tolerated by some people. I mean, they just, you know, they chew, they gnaw, they have these constantly growing incisors. We don't want them. So there's things about rodent biology that make them really uh, successful and very difficult to control. Um, and there's things that we can use about those as well. So they're very, very adaptable. So rodents are everywhere. So rats in particular are on the highest mountains. They're at sea level. They're in deserts. They're in you know, southern Atlantic islands, and um, you know, eating very endangered stormy petrels or the blue-footed whatevers. You know, they're, very, they're absolutely everywhere. Another thing that makes rats really difficult to control is their diet. They will literally eat anything, okay? So that makes them really difficult to control because if we knew exactly what their favorite food was, we'd be able to catch them much, you know, much easier. Their size makes them very difficult to control. If you have um, a pencil, okay, and you can stick this pencil into a hole in your home, a mouse will be able to squeeze through that hole. Okay, for a rat, thank you, it's um, less than a quarter inch. So it's very, very, very small holes. So that means like blocking up our houses is very important, but I mean, those holes are so tiny, how do you even see them? Okay, so that makes rodents difficult to control. And um, reproduction, I really hope you can see these lovely pictures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rats are just breeding machines, okay? And that's what actually makes them the most difficult to control. Okay, the behavior, the fact that they're neophobic, that doesn't help us. So I'm gonna talk about um, reproduction for a while. Okay, so if you're a roof rat, you're slightly less prolific than an Ori rat, which means that you produce slightly less babies in, in, a, in a breeding season. Um, so you are sexually mature at 12 weeks. You can have five to eight young in a litter, and adults live for about five to 18 months. So what does that mean? That means that if you're a rat, you can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten babies inside you. So not, this is not an American rat, this is actually an Indonesian rat. Um, but it's very, very similar story. That's the, actually the other side of the rat's uterus to use it at all. It just, it, it just didn't bother. This rat was lactating, which means not only did it have ta 10 babies in the inside, it probably had 10 babies on the outside too. Okay? And it had a stomach full of rice, okay? So like I said, this is an Indonesian rat, but this is the same situation that you're gonna get with rodents in Southern California. So just to show you what happens, two rats, you know, fall in love. <laughs> and they can have four litters in a year, okay? Up to about eight, eight um, pups in the litter, okay? Just say half of those are female, because on statistical average, half of them are going to be female. 
and they meet people <laughs> from other litters that are not their brothers and they fall in love <laughs> and they make babies okay so one rat breeds four times a year has about eight pups in their litter okay so that's four times eight that's 32 okay 50 percent of those are female they breed just once just once so that's eight by four uh, females buy all those litters so that's eight by four by four plus those original 32 rats that's 160 rats from one rat one rat okay this rat can breed four times in a year. Okay, so I only did once. These rats, the next generation, could probably be breed three times in a year. Okay, their generation could probably breed twice. So this is a huge underestimation. I just want to get to it through that one rat doesn't mean one rat. One rat means hundreds of rats. Okay, this is what I was talking about. These are the two generations. Okay, these guys almost ready to leave their mom's side and go and make some more of these. <laughs> okay, so you have, and this is Pajafar from Borough F, lovely, lovely place in Indonesia. Um, but you can get, like, this situation is happening all over, and not just with rats, but everything that are very prolific breeders. So that includes things like rabbits, pigs, okay. They're just popping generation out after generation after generation. So early in intervention is um, important. But it's not all bad news. We can use some of their biology to try and fight back. Okay? Adaptability, no. Diet, yes. Size, yes. Reproduction, mm, not. A little bit. Um, and definitely their behavior. And I can say this till I'm blue in the face. Be proactive, not reactive. Don't wait till you have five rats running around your yard. Don't wait till you see a rat during the day. If you see a rat during the day, there is a problem. Okay? It means that there's already so much competition at nighttime that those rats are forced to be active during the day, most likely. Okay? <coughs> rats during the day, not a good sign. Okay, so their diet. Right, so what can we do? Well, you need, this is for non-toxic control, so for things like um, trapping. I don't recommend that you ever try and live trap a rat. But you can, and it, it's, you can do it. But you need to examine your locally available baits. So just say that you have, you find that there's a rat in your, in your home, um, and it's in your, you know, your cupboards, and it's eating your cereal. You need to take that away. You need to make it no longer available to your rat. But then you could use that rat, that bait, in your trap, because you already know that the rat likes that bait, okay, and that's what they're eating at the time. Remember, rats are neophobic, they don't like new things, so if we, they're already not going to really like the trap, but if they know that there is, um, you know, a bait that they already like it there, they may be more likely to go into it. And um, another thing that I've been told, hasn't been tested, is that if you take a, a rodent dropping or feces and put it on the trap, it actually makes them more comfortable, because it, it uh, smells like one of their peoples has already been there, okay? Don't know if it's true, kind of makes sense. You can try it out. Generally, when I set a rat trap in a big infestation, if there's feces around, I'll just sprinkle them all over, like well, hundreds and thousands. What do you guys call them? Those are sprinkles. sprinkles, sprinkles, yeah. So, <laughs> if you don't, we call them hundreds and thousands. They're like the rainbow ones. But there's chocolate too. <laughs> so, if there's no local bait available, so if you know there's a rodent in your house and you're not, you, do, you can't find the bait, you can use something like coconut. All, all these rats that I'm talking about, nori rats, um, roof rats, house mice, they all came from Asia. What grows in Asia? Coconuts. Okay? Just saying. They like to eat coconut. But I generally, when I'm here, I use peanut butter. Okay? Peanut butter works really well. It's just very messy. Okay? If you're worried about the mess, make sure you, you can put it in with some rolled oats and it'll make it a little drier and a little easier to handle. Okay? Um, and that works pretty well as well. Use small bait balls. How many people here have set rat traps in their life? How many people have come back and the bait's been gone? and the rat traps being, yeah. You guys are using too much bait. So you're probably using one of these old traps here, okay? It should be pea-sized, the bait. It should be very, very small, okay? It shouldn't come over this trigger, okay? It should be tiny. What happened is, is that you guys probably put a big wad of whatever on there, and the rat just came in and just, bloop, picked it off from the side, okay? And that's what's happening. 
I like these traps here with the, de 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 the depressed bait recess and these ones here. You can see that this is the bait recess here. When you set the trap, the trigger actually lifts over the bait recess. Okay, so the rat has to go over this to get into this. Okay, so you don't have that problem. The problem with the two to bait the two baits with this, okay? If you're going to set these traps though, make sure that your bait is inside the bait recess. It shouldn't be spilling out over it, okay? Um, or it's just not going to work. If you do that and your bait goes, you probably don't have rats, you probably have mice. Okay, so mice are going to get over those traps and they're not going to set them off, okay? Because they're too light. Um, I do like these traps, but we also have, you know, we can also use our diet for toxic control. Um, you need to select good quality baits. As a homeowner, that's really difficult because the choices that you have for toxic baits are kind of bad, okay? And um, you can change it up if you want, if it's not working, but just don't change it too soon because they're neophobic. You want to give them enough time to get used to it. And um, I don't really know what that is, but it's certainly longer, it's certainly about a week anyway. Excuse me, do monitor um, because you want to know, is your management actually working? Okay, if your management's not working, you're either doing something wrong or you need to change it up slightly. Um, options for toxic control. For a homeowner, you have to use bait station. Absolutely have to. I think I left my bait station behind me. Um, but you guys probably know what they look like. Um, some of them are flat to the floor. Some of them are kind of a shaped <coughs> structure. Absolutely have to. You're not allowed to use any loose baits. Um, if you have any loose baits, um, they're probably illegal. Um, and then the other thing is, is that you generally only have, oh thanks, first generation um, anticoagulants or non-rodenticide anticoagulants available to you. One of the best things about first generation anticoagulants is that if you do use them, there is an antidote available. Okay, so if a child gets into them or, a, um, or an, a non-target, so something like a dog or a cat gets into them, there is an antidote available. Um, lots of people are very anti-anticoagulant, um, but the alternatives that they're providing us with, they don't have any antidotes, okay? And bromethylin is not the best bait for homeowners, but it's, once again, it's probably only the one, the only one that's available to you. And this is bromethylin here, and um, so, oh, I do have a bait station. So this is bromethylin here, and um, so this is your bait station. Okay, these are the little ones here. Okay, and the bait's not great. It really is not great. Um, whoops. Um, so, if you're a pest management professional or you want to hire one, you, you have more options. Okay, because second generation anticoagulants, which are the most effective used against commensal rodents, so rats and mice, um, they're very, very effective. Also has an antidote available, but there is a higher risk of secondary toxicity, and I'm gonna get that in, in into that in, in a minute. Now, if you have a bad rat problem, but you're concerned about using rodenticides, specifically anticoagulants, there are anticoagulants that are less toxic and less likely to become ingested secondarily, okay? So if you, if you have a pest management professional that comes to your, your home and controls your rats, you can request things like bromodialone over brodificum, okay? Brodificum is about as toxic as it gets when it comes to a second generation anticoagulant. And um, bromodialone is, is much less toxic, but still very effective. Um, your first generation anticoagulants, this is what you guys have available to you. Uh, Fluorofacinone, difacinone, warfarin, um, although this is less common due to warfarin resistant rodents. Um, you know, this is what a lot of people take in their, you know, their medicine, warfarin, rat poison basically, okay? Um, it's a multiple feeding anticoagulant, okay? So for the first generation anticoagulants, you have to, the, the, the mouse or the rat has to feed on them several times before they ingest a lethal dose, okay? And so they actually are quite low toxicity, okay? So the rat actually has to feed on them multiple times um, before they have any reaction. It's metabolized over several days and that's why you don't get as much buildup in the liver. 
Now, your second gen is your bromodialone, difenicum, difethylone, verdificum. Those are kind of hard to say unless you say them every day. Um, these are the ones here that I was telling you that are very, very toxic. So, um, verdificum and difethylone, those ones are the most toxic, okay? These ones, not so much. Now, they still are, um, they still are toxic and they're still very effective um, rodenticides. And the reason why we have more secondary toxicity with second generation anticoagulants is because they are only single feeding anticoagulants, right? So after one feeding, there's generally enough of the toxin inside the rat or the mouse to kill it. But it takes, you know, three to seven days for that rat to die. And what happens is that the rat goes back and eats more rodenticide. Okay, and it's not processed in the liver, and so they get this super lethal dose, and that's where this secondary toxicity comes from. And um, so this is bromethylene. This is probably one of your only choices as a homeowner at the minute. No antidote, but very little risk of secondary toxicity. Okay, very very little. And um, we do know we do need more research on the efficacy. It's it's not good, but we don't know how not good it is. Um, and it's nowhere near as effective as a second generation anticoagulants. I mean, it does work, but it's just not, you have to apply more pesticide to get the same result as if you applied small amounts of pesticide and to get rid of your rats, okay? Mechanism of action for bromethylin? Oh, what does that mean? It's a neurotoxin, I believe. I believe it's a neurotoxin, and um, I'm not 100% sure. So they're asking the mode of action, so it's not an anticoagulant, and um, I do believe it's a neurotoxin, yeah. So, yeah, also not, you know, very pleasant, but none of these things are, neither get your head switched to the trap. Um, <laughs> so, primary toxicity, okay? So these are the things that people are concerned about when they use rodenticide, okay? And primary toxicity is, is when the, the animal that ingests the toxin is the primary consumer, okay? So when a non-target eats the rodenticide, that's primary toxicity, okay? Why does it happen? Incorrect bait application. We go back to you can't manage what you can't measure. If you put a toxicant out, for something, it should probably eat it. Even rats that are neophobic will eventually eat that bait, okay? And um, it may be slow, but it will happen, okay? You didn't use a bait station. First of all, it's illegal and just stupid, okay? You shouldn't be putting bait out in the open. It has to be in a bait station, okay? And then no pests to consume the bait. Um, that's what I got my back to. Like, you can't manage what you can't measure. You need to know what you're applying your rodenticide for. Okay, so secondary toxicity. This is one of the big ones, okay? This is the reason why people do not want anticoagulants in the state of California, which they have actually tried to completely ban them recently. Um, <coughs> occurs when non-targets ingest prey that has previously been exposed to anticoagulants, okay? So your rodent eats your bait and your predator eats your rodent, okay? And that's how you get secondary toxicity. Rodents die below ground, not always an issue, but sometimes they don't. This is when it can be an issue. A lot of the times the rodents have this, don't have this super lethal dose, not always a problem. We do not have half the much in, as much information as we need on this topic. For instance, coyotes. People say, oh, the poor coyotes, they're getting secondary, secondarily um, poisoned. Um, coyotes don't eat rats and eat very, very little mice, okay? The only things that can eat these second generation anticoagulants are rats and mice. So we're not really sure what's going on and we need a hell of a lot more information before we go banning a very, very useful tool, okay? We need to know where are these predators getting these toxicants from? Is it because people are illegally using them? Well, if people are illegally, illegally using them, that's not a reason to to ban them. If that was the case, there would have been a lot of things in California that would have been banned long ago, okay? So that's just not the way it works. Um, and secondary toxicity generally associated just with the second gens, not with the first gens, and it's because the first gens 
that it's multiple feeding, so they're getting processed in the liver as the animal you know, feeds multiple times. Um, why does secondary toxicity happen? In great bait application, you know, you've thrown it out there, someone's just, eat, someone's just you know, eating it, too much of it, and then someone else has come along and eaten it. Or because of this super lethal dose, where the, the rat has come and ate like tons of bait, basically, and then the predator comes in and eats that. Um, anticoagulants and mange, this is generally um, a big argument as well for banning rodenticides in the urban environment. Um, this is actually a poor, um, sick coyote at the South Coast Research and Extension Centre. Um, I took this months ago and this coyote is still alive. Not, they're very, very resilient animals. Um, a lot of this came out of this paper here, the anti anticoagulant exposure in neodectric mange from bobcats and mountain lions in um, urban Southern California. So basically, what people say, not what this person says, but what people say is that anticoagulants are giving predators mange. Um, if you go onto their website, it says, although we have not found a specific association between mange and first generation anticoagulants, um, you know, so they even admit that they're not really sure what's going on. Um, I'm not saying that there's not an association, but it's definitely not a cause, okay? Um, remember, now this is difficult because a lot of people in Southern California have fruit trees, but there are no toxicants registered for use for protection of home fruit or nut trees. So technically, if your rats are just in your fruit trees, you're not supposed to use a rodenticide to control them. Rodenticides are for rodents in your home. Now most people would say, I don't want to use toxicants inside because the rat will die. And it will, um, and it will stink up my, my you know, dying walls. And stink. I tend to agree. I tend to agree that rodenticide is actually for outside, and traps are for inside. Okay, so if you do use rodenticide, it needs to be less than generally it's less than 50 feet from your, from a structure. So generally your house. Um, so um, you need to make sure that if someone happens to wander by from the Department of Pesticide Regulations and sees that you have a bait station in your tree, or you're using some sort of toxicant in your tree, that you say, oh, I have those in my house too, okay? They probably are in your house, but not all the time, okay? It's so, it's very complicated. DPR did not make it easy for anybody. So, this is, this is the size thing, okay? How do we use their size to control them? Well, they're so small, they can literally, it doesn't even have to be a hole, it could be a crack. They can just shimmy on through there, they're very small. As long as they can get their head through, they can pretty much squeeze the rest of their body through, okay? So you think you see a, small, a hole this big, how's a rat gonna get inside? But a rat's head could easily fit in there, okay? And they can kind of squeeze everything else in and around. Um, exclusion is the most successful and permanent form of house mouse control. So forget about trapping. You just need to try and fill those holes up. Okay, and um, I would recommend trapping while you fill those holes up, but you won't have to trap if you haven't, don't have any holes. Okay, and um, you can use sealant, caulks, all sorts of things. Just make sure it's high quality because rats can th through, chew through wire. Okay, remember? Okay, so they can chew through a lot of things. And um, a good thing when you're managing rodents is to um, somehow modify their burrows. So just say you've ground squirrels in your yard and you're trying to control them and they've got all these burrows all over the place but you've only got like four or five traps and they've got 50 burrows. Well you can stamp out the burrows and the ones that don't get reopened are old burrows that they don't use anymore. So you don't have to focus on them anymore. You can just focus on the ones that have been opened up. Um, reproduction, it would be great if we could target reproduction because this is what makes them the most successful. Um, it's best to target females, but we can't really do that. Um, breeding does occur year round, so there's not really times that we can focus it on. But for me, if I have a rat in my house, I kind of want to know it's female. And I'll tell you why, okay? Is because if you have a lactating female in your house, well then you probably just don't have one rat, okay? You probably have her baby somewhere, so I want to know that. Okay, so this, these are not great pictures, I actually have to scan these from a book. Um, but if your rat has no fur, or no, um, no obvious mammae on her, on her front, she's probably not breeding, okay? Right, just not obvious at all. If they're 
they're kind of obvious, but there's fur around them, well then that means that she's probably already weaned her litter. Okay? Now, if they're bald, like this one, and no, no fur around them, that means that she's actively nursing pups. Okay? And they're in your house somewhere. <laughs> okay? But it's good to know. Okay? If they're really, really young, they probably won't survive. If they're close to maturity, well then they'll be getting up and about and it's not, you haven't just got that rat in your, your, um, your house, it's time to just, you need to just keep up with the management. Um, the behaviour, how do we use that? Well they're very secretive, um, but their activity is important too. So, um, if you are concerned about non-natives, so people that set rat traps, have you ever caught, anyone ever caught a bird? Okay, yeah, you see it's common enough. Okay, when do birds not fly? At night. At night. When are rats active? At night. Okay, so if you just set your traps at night, you're probably not going to catch your birds. Okay? But you got to get up before sunrise. Yeah, or you could just set them at night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, things, there's ways around it, but like, if you are really concerned about that, just, just set them at night. Set them in the corners of places. Set them in, you know, secluded areas. Rats are kind of scaredy cats, okay? They don't really like to be out and about and in the open. Like I said, if you see one during the day out in the open, you're in big trouble. <laughs> yeah. Okay, their home range. How do we use their home range? Well, if you've just, it depends. Do you have just mice? Do you have roof rats and aura rats? Do you have rats and mice? Well, if you just mice, your bait stations and your traps should be set in a room and very, very close together. Now, if you can find your nest, generally in the kickboard, Okay, in your kitchen, probably, because that's where the most food is. You don't want to go more than 20 feet from that nest. Okay, but if you don't know where the nest is, you need to have your traps really close together and all over the place. Okay, because miss by an inch, miss by a mile. Okay, they don't go more than 20 feet from their nest. If you can't find the nest, look for things like feces. Look for things like, you know, signs of feeding. Where did you see the mouse last? Okay, if you saw the mouse over there, there's a chance that it probably goes over there. Okay, so you can set your trap. Okay, if you have rats and mice, well then you still need to do the same thing because you're not going to catch your mice if your traps are too far apart. Now if you have Norway rats and roof rats, you can put them much further apart, okay, which is actually cheaper, obviously, right? Um, I say this a million times over and over and over again. This is how you set rat traps. And people think I'm crazy, right? But people don't know how to set rat traps, okay? Always set them in twos, but multiples of twos. Don't, don't put two down, put several multiples of twos, okay? You can set them in two ways. Back to back like this, against the wall, triggers pointing out, okay? So triggers pointing that way, okay? Or you can set them like this, Side by side, triggers flush to the wall. And why like that? Well, if the rat comes along here, this is the rat down here, it's gonna run up along the wall, the side of the wall, and the first thing it's gonna run into is the trigger, okay? So it's gonna come in like this, boom, right? On this side, same thing, it's gonna run along the wall and it's gonna run over the triggers, okay? Don't just set the trap here, okay? Rats don't generally like to run anywhere else than along the side of the wall, okay? The same in your garden, same um, everywhere, generally beside the wall because one side is already protected from a predator, okay? So you don't have to wor worry about that side. So, but it is, I mean, the point is that it's just important to set your traps properly. <laughs> Too much time. <laughs> All right, so the same goes for bait stations. Your bait stations shouldn't be like this, okay? They should be, it should be as easy as possible for the rat or the mouse to run into your bait station, okay? That means that this hole away from the wall and this one here is not gonna work for a rat, okay? It should be along the wall like this, okay? Those are not, it's kind of hard to see on this, but hopefully you guys can see a bit better on the, on the screen. Um, uh, this is, I think it's 2801 2nd Street Davis. Anyone, else, anyone know what's at 2nd Street Davis? 
the UC IPM headquarters. Uh -oh. <laughs> so somebody needs some education because what's wrong with these bait stations? Uh -oh. Not against the wall. I was like, oh my god, I need pictures quick. <laughs> okay, because what's going to happen is is that the rat's going to run along the wall here and it's going to think. Oh, I'm just going to go and see what's inside this big scary black box. It's just going to run straight past it, okay? Which is probably what's happening, okay? So it's really, really important, and obviously the message has been lost somewhere. It's probably because there's the vertebrate pest person up in Northern California is not very good, you know? I'm just joking. Very busy. Okay, so um, another thing that makes, makes rodents difficult to control is their speed, their agility, they have the ability to swim. This is all difficult to overcome. It helps if you set your traps correctly because you're almost putting them in their path. So it's hard for them to jump over them. They will jump over them though. Um, rodents do use drains and bad drain sanitation has been linked to um, really bad rodent outbreaks. And um, there are places in San Diego County, very, very public places, that have really, really bad drain sanitations and really, really bad rodent problems, okay? And they're working on them, but it, it does happen. If you have bad, if you don't have clean drains, you're gonna get lots of rats. And they have rats running, running around the, 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 um, the walls or whatever. Um, so this is uh, Sir David Attenborough, shocked by rat on the toilet. They do swim, oh I don't have a picture. They can swim up the U-bend. Okay, they can. Okay, some poor Irish man was bitten on the backside recently as well. And um, it does happen. They're really good swimmers because they're from South. They're from South Asia and Southeast Asia, which has so much water. Okay, so they can just swim in rivers. They generally live in river banks. I mean, I would regularly stand in river banks in Southeast Asia and have rats and turds swim past me. It's very pleasant. So. They are neophobic, okay? Which means that they're scared of new things, so you know, we're not, you're, you're not really sure if it's working, give it a few more days. Okay, just give it a few more days and see what happens. It's really especially true for rats, okay? Not so much for mice, mice are kind of stupid, to be fair. They kind of just, they'll kind of eat or go, go anywhere, but that's very, very clever. The niche level, okay, niche level is where in space the animal occupies. Okay, so our niche level is generally on the ground. A bird's niche level is generally in the air, okay? For rats and mice, it's kind of different. If it's rats, it's all on the ground. Where should you put your traps? On the ground. If you're a nori rat, generally, nori rats do not climb. Okay, they actually live in the ground. So if you're a nori rat, you want to place your traps on the ground. If you're a roof rat, you spend a lot of your time up high. Okay, but because there's a lot of areas in Southern California that don't have any Norway rats, roof rats are kind of exploiting those areas as well. So you can put them on the ground and up high. Now if you have rats and mice, depending on what rat you have, you either want to put them all on the ground or a mix of both. So if you have um, house mice and roof rats, you're going to have some down low and some up high. If you have uh, house mice and Norway rats, well then you can just leave everything on the ground. I don't know what the story is with the, the nori rat in San Diego County. I just know in Orange County, there's hardly any of them. Okay, I don't, I really don't know. Scott, have you any idea? No, I don't know, I really, I have no idea. I'd have to talk to someone in your vector control agency to see what it is. Um, rodent cleanup, okay, like I said, a lot of the diseases in their urine and in their feces, okay? You need to wear rubber gloves if you're gonna clean it up. It needs to be wet. Okay, that's the most important thing. If you come across a rodent mess, whether it's chewed up pieces of fabric or paper or you know anything like that, it needs to be wet before you clean it because that will stop everything getting aerosolized. Okay, and that's the most important thing. If you have, especially if you have deer mice, deer mice are the ones that bring the hantavirus. Okay, you do not want that all that dust and stuff to get kicked up. So just say you've got a mess in your garage, just go in, give it a good spray, let it all soak in, and then you can, what you should do is clean up the mess with a paper towel, okay? And then you could go in and hose it down if you wanted, okay? So you wanna kind of clear up the immediate threat. Do not sweep, do not sweep, okay? Even if it's wet, it's not a good idea to sweep because you're just gonna kick everything up, okay? 
Um, I think we're going to take a break. Yeah, okay, we're going to take a break and then we're going to come and do some really quick gopher stuff and then you guys are going to have a chance to amputate your fingers. <laughs> <laughs>